Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Viva Physical Media. I'm Emily. I'm Kevin. And today is the hottest day that Seattle has ever seen. It's true. I, it's a, I'm not being dramatic. Nope. Although you, I usually am, but this is real. <laughs> if you listen real close, hold on. Do you hear that? That's the that's the AC in this in this uh, place that is going strong, which is good because it's keeping us cool. But it's not great because you hear it right now. So you probably will be. It'll be off and on during during the whole thing. Yeah, so audio, apologies, but you know we're not we don't want to die of heat stroke while we're talking. Right, to you. because did you know that Seattle is like the biggest like metropolitan city that doesn't have like the majority of people don't have AC in. Mm -hmm. it's stupid. The last two days I've done nothing but stay inside my my house, sleep, wake up, watch movies. Oh try to keep yeah, cool. I've like done. I haven't worked or anything in the past two days. I've watched a ton of movies of all crazy types. I like lost all sense of time. Nick put tinfoil up on all the windows <laughs> and we put like blankets up. And so it's like a bunker and we moved our bed into the living room. So it's like a really weird reality in my house right now. I watched a bunch of different things, some funny like 80s horror stuff like Ghost in the Machine. And then I watched like 90 Day Fiance. And then I watched the Holocaust documentary, The Last Days, and then I watched The Master. There's no <laughs> rhyme or reason to it, and it's just like I. But that's how my watching normally is. Is there's no rhyme and re mm -hmm. or reason to it. I always have, I always have like four or five movies checked out that are of different genres on purpose because I'm like, well, you I don't, don't know, know what you're gonna feel like. I don't know what I'm gonna feel like. I don't know what I'm gonna want to watch. And you have tinfoil on your windows, and, and you texted us about how it was like your. Like you're in the movie I was actually bug. Dead. Yeah, uh, that's how I felt. <laughs> at, at one point, I literally moved the curtain to look outside, and had forgotten it was covered in tinfoil. I mean, this is the most like clothes I've worn in Same. the last like three days too. Yeah. So you know, you're um, welcome or sorry. I don't know. You're welcome on, or depending sorry. Depending on how depending on how you feel. I don't but know, no we're judgment. at Scarecrow. Yeah, we're here. AC is going. It's nice. We're open to the public now. Uh, 20th episode. Thank you guys yeah. for watching. If you've been watching since episode one, you've probably seen us hopefully get a lot better at this. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe not today. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe worse. Oh, I don't think we've gotten worse. No. Wouldn't Everybody comment that we've gotten better just yeah. to make us feel good. We have heard from people who are like, <laughs> oh, I'm just like binge, binge watching yeah. all of them, which would be interesting to like see <laughs> our progression. Oh, and Scarecrow 2.1 fundraiser still going on. We're still trying to get our money to uh, to improve that. So you know, if you haven't gotten a, a reward, or you know someone who would want a reward, you know, get it for them. Or if you just want to donate some money, yeah. Do that too. Or if you want your soul to have the reward of knowing you did something good, you know. <laughs> yep, uh, kindness is its own reward. It really is. It really is. If you watched the last episode, I discussed that I am returning to RaunchCom summer 2021. Going up into the comedy room and just looking for what they look like on the cover, <laughs> really embracing the physical medianess of it all. Last time I watched uh, Beach Girls. The Beach Girls. So Beach Girls and? actually like wasn't super bad. It was pretty, it was pretty good vibes. Thank you. I forgot I had that down there. Pretty good vibes all around. Um, it's about these two girls, three girls, and they graduate high school and they're like, let's throw a party. They go to their friend's house and she's, she's kind of more reserved, but she's staying at her uncle's house until he gets home from vacation and she's house sitting and they're like, let's throw a huge party. And she's like, fine, but we just got to be done before uncle Carl gets back. And basically the whole movie is them throwing a series of parties. These girls are like, we need to find boys. So these girls like go to the phone book and they like call up oh pizza delivery service and they they ask for like their hottest pizza delivery men and they go to like repair service and like uh, apparently all these guys can just like go there and then just not go back to their jobs and just party at this house i'm having a little trouble like, oh, I'm okay there. okay that's good and yeah. then all of a sudden it turns into this this crazy thing where these uh drug dealers um on a boat like have to get rid of like garbage bags full of weed so they throw them overboard before the coast guard can get them they wash up on the beach where the party is uh -oh. going and so the the final party over this weekend everyone gets stoned including <laughs> uncle carl who came back early relax uncle carl you're so tight 
I was like worried it could get a little like you know rapey, which is like always the risk with these movies. Mm -hmm. It's really not. It's just a bunch of kids partying. There's lots of boobs, but there's also lots of male butts. Lots of people getting stoned and having a good time all around. Even Uncle Carl, you know, ends up having a good mm -hmm. time. Fucking Uncle Carl. Mm -hmm. Fucking Uncle I Carl. I can't believe it. And and this wacky like weed washing up on the beach vibe was was unexpectedly fun. So if you're like looking for some mindless beach party 80s movie with lots of boobs go with beach girls because it, it, it won't it won't really you know it's it's not bad it's not gonna harsh your vibes it's who, not gonna harsh your vibes and, at all and who isn't looking for that movie right uh, oh wait the best thing about this movie <laughs> is that there is a dog in three different scenes who steals bikini tops what okay so how many bikini tops do you rate it Three out of five, but for the genre. So it's not like three out of five for the for movie. No, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, but three out of five. So three out, three out of five bikini tops. Yeah, there is like there is like two kind of racist things in here though. So just mm. look out for that. But it overall like did better than I expected, which is kind of like the point of this whole thing. Right. Blu-ray looks great too. Excellent. And lots of fun music. So yeah. Why All not? Right. Everybody check, check, out, check out Beach Girls. Check out Beach Girls. Um, the next... it, seems like a good, it seems like a good vibe. It's really good vibes. Good vibes. Um, next time, I'm going to be doing... Uh, we get two of them there. I'm, I'm going to do a back-to-back, -back <laughs> and hopefully it won't be terrible. Um, we're going to be doing <laughs> the Bikini Car Wash Company and Bikini Car Wash Company 2, which is only on VHS. You can only find it here at Scarecrow, probably. I haven't seen either of those, but I know... you got to be 18 or older, though. Oh, shit. I know um, our good friend Travis Vogt is a big fan of oh, really? one of these ones. He wrote it. I think he maybe even wrote about it for our blog back in the day. Well, I might have, we'll have to, to ask him. Yeah, you I might, might have to source ask some you. You quotes him from about him. It. <laughs> I'm kind of excited. These look so silly. <laughs> um, also, the back of this DVD is written in Comic Sans. Things get hilariously out of hand. As Melissa and her bubbly friends dress for success in the skimpiest bikinis or nothing at all. Um, I'll let you guys know if this is anything at all or a woman entrepreneur movie or if it's just about bikinis and boobs. I'll let you guys know about it. That's my little Raunchcom update. Awesome. I can't wait. I can't wait for more Raunchcom updates. Raunchcom summer 2021. Hell yeah. Is that a salami in your pocket or are you just glad to see me? It's a salami. So, on the hottest day of the year, of the world, of all time. <laughs> of our world, at least. Literally. Yeah. Uh, we decided, in our 20th episode, yeah. that we want to, like, sprinkle in some fun stuff. Yeah. Hopefully we have. We wanted to just, like, quickly go through a few of our favorite hot, hot movies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, because we were talking about movies about the heat, but I'm probably going to have a couple that are, like, the antidote to the heat, yeah, too. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. I always, when I think of hot movies, I think of, like, the... The sweatiest, mustachioed man, um, William Hurt in Body Heat, which I know yeah, you're I was familiar gonna, with. I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna say Body Heat for sure. Um, very sweaty. <laughs> Kathleen Turner, and it's it's like it's like one of the hottest movies ever made. Sexiest. But I mean, just hottest, just the hottest. Like yeah, really yeah, hot. yeah, it's very um, hot. It's a lot very of hot movie. sweaty sex, and yeah. William Hurt is kind of hot in it like yeah attractive yeah not just and not like he's sweaty but he's too. also like he's really also hot. really sweaty i feel like the 80s like postman always rings twice is like hot very hot and aggressively it's, sexy because of the heat and gross sweat movies. it's sweaty it's a gross it's it's sweaty in a gross way yeah though. but not in a, i don't know yeah but that's I'm true i'm not saying it's in a good way i'm just saying like <laughs> uncomfortably uncomfortable I watched to recently, look at yeah. two people like kissing and doing more in the heat. Well, there's a lot of good. There's a lot of good those thrillers of that time. The Hot Spot with Don Johnson. That's uh, that's a good like, uh, sweaty, sweaty sort of neo noir. I know in a lot of TV shows, there's always that one episode where it's the hottest day. Oh yeah. And then tensions boil to the surface, and people hook up, and secrets are revealed, and all that. Well, speaking stuff. of the hottest, the you know hottest day, the best, the best hottest day movie, do the right thing. Do the right thing. Yeah. The second best like that hottest day movie is summer of sam directed by spike lee as well which right. also takes place on the hottest day it's not necessarily like a hottest day you know it's not a movie about the hottest day or like a noir or anything but it was uh Werner herzog's agire the wrath of god it is about a bunch of people on a boat lost in the fucking you know rainforest right. and it I don't know that the movie itself is very sweaty, but it, it you get that feeling. You feel you feel the humidity from that movie. Yeah. While he's chucking monkeys off of a boat, you're like, man, that's and they're all wearing it. they're all wearing it's because it's these conquistadors, right? Mm -hmm. And they're wearing like armor and shit. They're just walking down these heavy. It's just like yeah, it's like the thing where you know you're like, man, this is not. This is not a uh, this is not an ideal situation not a cool here for situation. anybody. <laughs> 
cat in a hot tin roof and streetcar named Desire. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kind of sweaty Brando. Oh, yeah. What's, what's better, you know? Tennessee Williams was just like... He, sweaty. Yeah, that was all those... All his movies <laughs> were sweaty melodramas. I mean, all his, I mean, all of his scripts were yeah. sweaty melodramas. Right, plays, exactly. Yeah. One of the things I watch a lot when, I, when it's hot is, like, to counter that is, like, uh, Bergman. Like, his black and white ones, mostly. Winter Light, especially, is one of the best Bergmans in short, too. So if you want to just, like cool off and then also maybe feel a bit like oh no <laughs> existentially <laughs> black and white heat movies i i thinking a lot of like antonioni movies like red oh, desert yeah. maybe i mean a movie that like i know you love that i think is good that like gives you that vibe but isn't necessarily a summer movie would be like uh and a lot of people hate would be uh, aronofsky's mother <laughs> Actually, Ugh. a movie that's just that gonna just claustrophobic. That's what I mean, but it's gonna make you sweat. Yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna like, just feel. That's gonna like how I felt at my house warming <laughs> on Friday. Oh, with all those people. <laughs> it's like oh my god. I feel like I bring up on the show constantly Wake and Fright, which is maybe the sweatiest mm -hmm. movie of them all. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then there was another movie that I wanted to watch but didn't get to it because I was like, I was like, let's Google some hot movies. Yeah. This horror movie called Two Hundred and Forty Seven Degrees. <laughs> Which is about this group of people who go vacationing and then they get locked in a sauna. I really want to watch this movie, but I don't want to watch it today. Another kind of shittier horror movie that is the antidote to hot heat. There's this movie called Windchill that I really like, where these people get lost in their car um, and then temperatures drop below freezing and you kind of just like watch them uh, lose their minds and freeze to death. Oh, shit. Uh, I remember watching that and actually being like, I swear it's like colder like in my house. Like That's it was very up. atmospheric. <laughs> The ultimate uh, sticky, sweaty, uncomfortable horror movie, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh yeah. The original, where you yeah. just feel those, you feel the flies on your skin watching Ooh, that movie. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, I feel like you can also, Hills Have Eyes has also got that. Yep, yep. Any of the, yeah. any of the desert yeah. or backwoods horror will, will get yeah. you there. Those are some, those are some. Yeah, uh, I don't know quick, if you want to watch those right now or avoid them, <laughs> but th that's what we got for some, you. Some quick recs for movies to either, uh, to either just uh, succumb to the heat or to uh, try and try and at least beat the heat for a minute. Yep. So I'm gonna talk about a favorite of mine, a favorite of a lot of people at the store. If someone was like, "What's the strangest movie you've ever seen?" This would be, but top top of the food chain for one. me is uh, John Pay's Crime Wave. <laughs> And it was released here under the title Big Crime Wave because it came out, it was released around the same time as Sam Raimi's Crime Wave. <laughs> this movie is about a man, uh, Stephen Penny, played by John Pays himself. He lives in a garage of a family, um, and in the movie, the whole movie is narrated by the uh, the girl. It's like a mom and a dad and this little girl, Kim. This and, girl uh, has my same haircut. She does have your same haircut. Uh, she narrates the whole movie and it's kind of shot in, it's almost shot like an industrial film, like an educational film. A lot of parts are like the montages that are like an educational film that show you how how like the persistence of vision works or whatever. He's uh, what she keeps calling a color crime filmmaker, but he's he's trying to write movies, but he can only come up with uh, beginnings and endings. He has trouble with the middles. And so throughout the movie, it will it'll cut away from like the rea you know from the real world to these these scripts that he's written or whatever. The top few guys made it. On the East Coast, there was Eddie Carlton's tribute to Buddy. And they're about like rock stars or murderers and stuff like that. But it'll only be the beginnings. And then it'll go, and then she'll, it'll cut back to Kim, and she'll go, and here's the, here's how that ends. And it'll cut to the ending, but there's never the middle part. <laughs> it's one of those movies. It's kind of like a you have to see it, you have to see it kind of movies because yeah. it's it isn't um, it's all, it's all in the style and the when execution was it, and stuff. When was it made? Uh, like 1986. Um, the cover looks so very like 1940s. 1985. Yeah, and I mean it's it's, <laughs> it's in the style of that. It's yeah. like it's like and it it all takes place in this idyllic, you know, sort of. Uh, suburb world he's a very weird character he doesn't talk at all through the whole movie that becomes kind of like a kind of a bit of a thriller mm -hmm. towards the end thought hey hey ah! he made a bunch of short films too we have a collection of his short films also uh, some of them are the i don't think it's the same character but they're a sort of a trilogy of movies like Spring, Springtime in Greenland is one, but they're all, 
they're all like very much the same style like they're not fake educational films but they're like in that style yeah. of like an industrial film or educational film or something uh but he also he made stuff after that he's from winnipeg same i think he went to i think he actually went to school with guy madden oh. so like these you know it's these it's all these Winnipeg filmmakers are just weirdos, uh, <laughs> but in a but in a very uh, very if you're from in a Winnipeg, very productive we're sorry, way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't. I mean, if you're from Winnipeg, send us your short film. I want to see it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't mean weird. I don't mean in a bad way. <laughs> Certainly, it's one of the weirdest movies ever. I think everyone should should check it out if you're looking for a movie that isn't is unlike any other movie. John Pay's Crime Wave fits that bill. Tagline: He was a quiet man. <laughs> That's all you need to know. It's true. Okay, so my Rex today, um, I went for a kind of uh, alt girl coming of age vibe. Oh, you did a theme? Nice. I did because I wanted to talk. I kind of wanted to just like mention this movie I watched recently, and then I was like, I also want to mention one of my favorite movies. Awesome. So uh, we'll start off with the movie I watched recently, which is called uh, Gypsy '83. <laughs> This movie is directed by Todd Stevens, who I wasn't familiar with. He's done a few other things. I've heard of the movie called Another Gay Movie, mm -hmm. which is what he's I've directed. Heard of that, yeah. And then he also has a movie coming out this year called Swan Song. This came out in 2001, and it's about this girl in her early 20s named Gypsy and her best friend Clive, who just graduated high school. He's 18, and uh, takes place in 2001 as well in like a small town, and they're like uh, they're like goth young youngins who are like outcasts in their town and uh, they're obsessed with Stevie Nicks. Gypsy especially is obsessed with Stevie Nicks. She like has a bunch of shawls and like dresses and like lace and like she has her hair and she even wants to be a singer like her and she kind of sounds like her when she sings. And Clive is just coming into coming into coming out basically so okay. he's like just kind of come out as being gay and he's really embracing the whole like uh like the cure vibe watching it is very it's kind of like cringy and corny uh -huh. but i feel like it's that in an authentic way because when you're young like that and learning like your super passionate interests, you are kind of cringy and corny i feel oh, yeah, like I especially mean, yeah yeah and so that's what i kind of liked about it It was authentic in its corny cringiness, basically. Okay. Gypsy's mom had left her and her dad a long time ago, and she uh, sees her mom's picture on a flyer, and a flyer was uh, saying that there was gonna be this night of a thousand Stevies in New York City where everyone comes, Ooh. and it's like, a th it's like, do you remember how they used to do like Bowie Miss in Seattle? It was like a, a heard about big that. like festival. Everyone would like dress up as different renditions of David Bowie, and it was like, okay. you know, a thing. Um, so in this movie, it's Night of a Thousand Stevies, and so her and Clive decide to road trip there. And so it's basically a coming of age road trip movie, uh, where these two outcast, dorky, kind of goth alt kids are are headed to New York City to try to see if they can find somewhere that they belong. Like I was telling you earlier, I didn't love it. It wasn't like so amazing, but I feel like I've never heard it talked about in the realm of coming of age films, highlighting more alternative like subculture, especially right. around 2001, like this weird like, right. like hot topic-y like Y2K <laughs> goth, but looking back at like Stevie Nicks. They end up in New York City and I, you know, they kind of discover that it's, it's not all like happy endings. Like, oh yes, I belong here. It's more like finding who you are. Like, you know, right. your typical coming of age, but I think highlighting a lot of different things that, that aren't so typical in these kind of movies. Gypsy 83, I would check it out. Um, if you're into coming of age movies, if you were ever like a weird, dorky, cringy, uh, you know, semi-goth girl, like, like I was, and I'm sure many of you viewers used to be, Gypsy 83 2001, Todd Stevens. Check it out. So my next movie is one of, it's probably one of my most 
viewed movies of all time, and it is 1997's Gross Point Blank. Gonna be bright, 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 sunshiny day. Actually, I brought my... I recently got it on Blu-ray, like, re by recently, like, I mean, like, a month ago. Up to that point, I was watching this VHS tape. That's awesome. Uh, not daily, but, like, uh, five, six times a year, I would pop this tape in and watch Gross Point Blank. It is rewound because uh, my friend, uh, recently, he was watching this with someone else, and he's like, he's like, hey, we were watching this, and, like, something happened to it, and we can't watch the rest of it. Do you have gross point blank and i'm like yeah but only on tape so we, so i actually had to fast forward to like and that's the power. halfway through the movie and then he came over so he watched the first that half that is I why think. physical media is important <laughs> so you can be that friend for your friend yeah, i haven't gotten rid of it even though i got the blu-ray just have sentimental attachment to it gross point blank we, it, weirdly i think it's something a lot of people know about but it also feels like it still is like it's maybe like a cult thing kind yeah. of like i don't know that it ever it, that it's like as popular as I feel it should be. I think it's a great movie. I think it's it's my favorite John Cusack performance. It's directed by a guy, George Armitage, who also did another movie I really love called Miami Blues with, oh, that's uh, a good one. with that's Alec Baldwin, which is movie. also, which is very similarly to, similar to this. It's Alec Baldwin. You feel like it should be this movie. Like everybody knows about this, but then you recommend it to people and they go, what the hell is this movie? It's, it's a, a weird movie. That movie. But this movie is just about, it's about uh, Martin Blank, who's a uh, John Cusack, who's a hitman, And he gets a letter from his high school about a high school reunion. He's like, I don't want to go, but his secretary, played by his sister, the hilarious Joan Cusack, is like, you should go. Anyway, there's a job that's going, that's that you should do that's in Detroit, right by Gross Point, where your reunion is. So you could go to the reunion, you go kill a guy in Detroit, and you come home. You could do both. And then it's basically him revisiting his past, uh, he you know has to relitigate what happened on prom night when he left Mini Driver there. Smart. I know who you are. You're not dead. Hi. Hi. Shake my hand. How are you? I'm I'm a hitman. I'm a professional killer, and they're like, "Ha! Do they get do you get dental with that?" Nobody really believes him. I mean, he's being very upfront yeah. about it the whole time. He's like, "Like, what'd you what'd you do? What'd you happen to you?" Well. I went crazy, joined the army, I'm a professional killer. Meanwhile, Dan Aykroyd is another assassin who's who's like hectoring him to join this assassin's guild that he's trying to form so that they can get better deals and stuff. Get what? Get back. Hey, <laughs> bing, 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 bang. Popcorn. Yeah, whatever. It's got some great action scenes. There's really cool uh, fight scene in like a school hallway with, uh, this, with this guy. <laughs> It's got a fucking killer soundtrack. Uh, great, like, 80s soundtrack. Joe That's, Strummer did the score. Joe Strummer did the score. But maybe you haven't thought about Gross Point Blank in a while. Maybe <laughs> it's time for a revisit. Shit, I also, oh I keep going back and forth if I've seen this or not, and I haven't I haven't checked my, my letterbox yet, but I don't know if I have. I think I might have mixed it up with a different John Cusack movie. Say anything? No. Uh oh. The one with Angelica Houston as his mom. Oh, The Grifters? I think I've mixed it up with The Grifters. Oh, yeah. Totally different than The Grifters. Also, The Grifters, also a great movie. Yeah. If you haven't in a while, it, it might be time for that uh, It might be time for that reunion with you and Gross Point Blank. What have you been doing with your life? Uh, professional killer. Oh, good for you. It's a growth industry. So this next movie, similar uh, coming of age s alternative, uh, you know, movie, I guess, uh, but way, way, way better. One of my favorite movies ever. It's called Smithereens. This movie is directed by Susan uh, Seidelman before desperately seeking Susan, which I really need to rewatch. This uh, girl is a runaway from New Jersey and she is a super artsy and punk and she runs to runs away to New York cuz she wants to be a part of the cool underground kind of like DIY scene and she works at a like a copy like a printer place and so she prints a bunch of flyers with her face on it that says like who is she she's trying to like she's trying to build up her character so people will be like oh my god like who is she <laughs> and she like goes to all these shows and stuff and she she really just wants to be like where it's at she wants to be cool she wants people to think that she is it she steals from chicks on the subway. She takes like sunglasses and, and robs people's purses and stuff to get money. Her goal is to 
basically like hook up with hot punk boys and bands so that she can go to LA eventually. Boy, so was a bus driver, he kicked me off the bus. I had a good laugh at him, I'm paid to get on the bus anyway. And and make it big there, but she doesn't have any money, so she has to like become a groupie basically. And so it kind of just shows her desperately trying to become this like image of what is cool in her mind by like making relationships with these people who she also thinks are just the coolest and it's really interesting because a it's it's very like guerrilla filmmaking like uh susan seidelman like filmed throughout new york in like early 80s um without permits i think almost everywhere like this like gritty kind of crumbling nyc like underground clubs and stuff and i i feel like it really captures the punk scene of that time not that i was there or anything but it just it feels very authentic <laughs> and raw and the music is great i f i feel like I, I i very much relate to aspects of this movie in that like I was also just like at one time a girl like desperate to impress a dude with a shitty mattress on the floor, you know what I mean? <laughs> or who like, lives in a van. Exactly, or who lives <laughs> in a van, like literally like placing these types of people on such pedestals in order to become cool yourself or the, the, the definition of cool that somehow you've, you've come across. It's very much like a, a female coming of age movie in, in that way where it's like, no, I don't want to deal with like who I actually am. I want to deal with who I want to be. I don't want to do anything possible to be that, that person, especially in the like music scene or the art right. scene, you know? And it just looks really good and the music's fucking awesome and it's sad, but it's also funny. Yeah, and yeah. the ending is, is kind of heart wrenching. And, yep. and I definitely suggest you guys watch it. It's part of that like no wave kind yeah. of thing. Like her, like Jarmusch, all those like these New York filmmakers at that time who just were like, like, fuck it, we're making movies that are about kind of nothing, about just a lot of people here. we hang out with. Yeah, and just like going out there and shooting mm -hmm. in the streets and like filming the crumbling New York of that period or whatever. Yeah. I forgot about this as the, uh, the first American independent film ever to play at the Cannes Film Festival. Oh, yeah, yes. Um, to compete for the Palme d'Or, which is pretty, which is pretty cool, pretty big that deal. Really Nineteen eighty-two, uh, and the girl so. is like the main girl. The character's name is Ren. She's she's like not likable. Yeah, you know, <laughs> she's like obnoxious. She's uh, making bad like decisions. You're like, God, you're getting something. yourself into this mess. Oh, get out of my seat. What do you mean your seat? I don't see your name written on it or nothing. Oh, those assholes, get the fuck out of my seat. At the same time, like I said, it, it it hits on a relatable level for I think I don't want to speak for all like women who have been in like the music scene or the DIY art scene at any point in your life. There's this obsession with like people like character main characters being likable though, and it doesn't need and to happen. And I think that it sucks. Some of the best <laughs> best protagonists in any story are the ones who are unlikable. Because and, like, like are like, you going through life your <laughs> in your experiences? Like, can you truly say that you're a completely likable person either? Exactly. It's like you and like every every unlikable character that you ever see in a movie, you're you're like. I, I relate to okay. I relate to that. Yeah, I relate to right. that. I I know I've mentioned before. I'm not like a huge rewatcher of stuff. I've definitely watched this movie like five or six times. Nice. Um, and for me, that's that's a lot of times. Awesome. You're gonna pay for this. <laughs> hey everyone, it's me, the Alor Cinephile. Today's film features a metric plethora of cats. In fact, it sets a total record for the show. And that scene from Three Lives of Thomasina doesn't count because that was done with Hollywood flim flam, and this is the real deal. But enough preamble. Today's film is 1969's Eye of the Cat, directed by David Rich from the screenwriter of Psycho, starring Michael Sarazen and Gail Honeycutt. And yeah, I've never heard of it either. The film opens with a damn fine opening credit sequence. There's an establishing shot of a San Francisco neighborhood superimposed with shots of a striding, determined orange tabby. All the while, this echoing, slow timpani steadily grows into a menacing Lalo Schifrin score. This cat is trying to get into this house, but he can't find a way in it. Just then, an old woman in a wheelchair is taken to her car, and before they can take off, the cat secrets itself inside and, and goes along for the ride to the beauty parlor, where the old woman gets a hair did and then has a near fatal attack of emphysema. And it's all done with, with montages and split screens. It's arty and it's great. The opening sequence ends with the beautician rolling up to this apartment. She goes inside, doesn't even knock, 
And inside she finds a very free-spirited and very shirtless Michael Sarazen hanging out with his lady friend. And incidentally, if you're the kind of person who gets excited about a shirtless Michael Sarazen, then this movie is for you. Anyway, she's all like, are you Wiley? And he's like, yeah. And she's like, well, come with me. And he's like, okay. And then they leave to the total bafflement of his lady friend. Like, who are these people? Do they know each other? What in the fuck is going on? And this is sort of how this movie kind of wins. This is where it's good. It does build this general uh, atmosphere of mystery. Now, what it eventually does with that atmosphere is another thing, but we'll get there. The beautician, who is Gail Honeycutt, uh, and whose character name is Kasha, takes him back to the beauty salon and gives him the royal treatment. The whole time, he thinks that he's struck gold, that this is some kinky stranger who's just picking him up, and they're gonna have a, like, you know, he's gonna get some action. But, joke's on him, she's just there to uh, cut away his bohemian edge because she has a plan. You see, she noticed just how weak that older woman was who almost died at her beauty salon. That so happens to be Wiley's Aunt Danny. And she knows that if she can convince Wiley to go back home, he'll get put back on the will. She'll then kill the aunt and they'll both share the money. Easy peasy, right? And just when Kasha is about to give in to one of Wiley's countless sexual invitations, he feels the presence of a cat. At this point, Michael Sarazen goes into how when he was a kid and he was a baby in a crib, a cat jumped in there with him and it served him so hard he is still in shock over it. He gets catatonically afraid whenever time he sees a cat. And just as his story reaches a crescendo, the orange tabby, the one we saw from the beginning, who's been in that room listening the entire time, jumps on him. He flips out, grabs the cat, and loyal viewers, at this point, you may want to look away. He takes the cat and throws him into the heater. The heater explodes and the scene ends. Now, that is the last time you're going to have any violence against cats, so you can open up your eyes again. Although, uh, Aunt Danny does have one scene of off-scene treachery. Now, I promised you, faithful viewers, that there was gonna be a lot of cats in there, and we're getting there. You see, Wiley, when he returns back to the house, he wants to surprise his, his aunt that he, on his return. So he's told that she's asleep in the bedroom. So he sneaks in and opens the door. And what does he see? But a room absolutely full of cats. There is a fantastic 360 pan that just lets you take in the horrific situation that Wiley is seeing. And I counted 23 cats. Word on the street is the production used over 50. Needless to say, Wiley rocks the fuck out of there and it's gonna take a lot more to convince him to do this. This will not be the last time you see this army of cats. Eventually, the ant does kick all the cats out and Wiley moves in. And now we have all the players under one roof. We have the doting Aunt Danny, who loves Wiley and literally can't wait to change the will. You have Wiley, the aloof hippie, who doesn't even seem to want the money. Wiley's younger brother, Luke, who we haven't even talked about, but he stayed behind and stayed with Aunt Danny while Wiley's been away, even though Aunt Danny and Luke absolutely resent the shit out of each other. And then you have Kasha, who, I guess, wanted to keep an eye on her investment, decides to sneak and live inside the house while all this is going on until the deed is done. There are a lot of uncomfortable moments between these characters. There's a lot of loaded dialogue, and there's an omnipresent air of malevolence. I am almost positive you're gonna figure out what the twist is. The movie tries very hard. It throws a lot of red herrings at you. It tries to trip you up, I guess. And it makes this great atmosphere, but it kinda doesn't really work. The script really isn't up to the challenge unfortunately, but it's not bad. Now the very, very end I actually like and I, it actually surprised me. So, you know, it's got that. This is a mystery and I don't really want to go into everything that happens uh, from here on out. Although there is one scene I do want to talk about because I think it's pretty funny. When Wiley is, ta is walking to his aunt's house uh, before, you know, he, the whole cat scene I mentioned earlier, he's reminiscing uh, about being a kid. And it's just, you know, you, so we get this Vaseline smeared uh, flashback of Wiley and Luke as children, and they're both dressed as Cub Scouts. And Wiley just, for some reason, says, I'm the king of Octavia, and I hereby decree all slaves are abolished. You're like, well, that's kind of weird. But then, off camera, you hear, Wiley, Luke, 
Your father's leaving. And the camera pans over to see a coffin be put into a hearse. And you're like, what the fuck? And it makes sense, I guess. It's trying to say that, you know, their parents died when they were young and, they, and these two brothers were staying with the aunt and you get it. But still, I repeat, what the fuck? But all in all, Eye of the Cat is pretty good. It's not a classic. Like I said, the plotting isn't super. There's a lot of counterculture references and scenes that are obviously written by people who don't know what the counterculture was and definitely was not a part of it. But it does great, make this great menacing vibe and the cast is fantastic. And speaking of the cast, while everybody is great and is totally down for the kind of movie they're in, which is, which is helpful in this case, I think probably the best person in it is Gail Honeycutt playing the very dangerous Kasha. At one point in the movie, she says that she is not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of anything, Wiley. And you fucking believe it. She is smart and she is strong and she is a force to be reckoned with. Now, one point in the movie, I mentioned that the cats were kicked out. And to accomplish that, uh, there's just a scene that shows Luke trailing some meat out and the cats, the, the army of cats is following him out and they get rid of him, etc., etc. <laughs> But did you know cats can never be a vegetarian or a vegan? It's true, all cats. And I mean, from lions down to your neighbor's uh, crazy tortie are obligate carnivores, meaning they cannot survive without animal protein. Dogs, uh, humans, for example, can all create the amino acid taurine, but cats can't. So they need to get it from other source. If you were to force a plant-based diet onto a cat, that would lead to blindness, uh, heart problems and ultimately death. Give the Boca burgers to the dog and give the steaks to the cat. And that's cat fact. How about cat fact for this movie? Even though there's over 50 cats in this movie probably, the standout is obviously the orange marmalade boy who uh, steals the show and is just listening and is all over the movie. He is credited uh, in, the, in the credits as Talia, but his real name was Scarface. And this is his only movie. And in movies like this, again, like anytime you have a, a, an animal actor, usually there's multiple animals playing the same role because, you know, animals are finicky sometimes. But you can always tell when it's gonna be Scarface because he has this really adorable, round, chonky head and his eyes seem a little too close uh, for comfort. And he's a little uncanny, but he's adorable and you'll, you'll definitely notice him. And he was trained by Ray Berwick, who was very famous at the time. Uh, he was the animal uh, trainer guy to go to. Uh, he trained the birds for the birds. In, in interviews over the time, Ray Berwick has been, let's say, disparaging and maybe downright shitty uh, to cats as actors. He did not prefer them, but he praised Scarface. He loved him because Scarface would be able to do everything he was asked to do. A lot of uh, productions will have multiple cats uh, and they're all trained for one thing. So you have a cat that's trained to strike or a cat that's trained to jump or to hiss or to do something. And certainly those cats were on set for when Scarface was, uh, as he would put, as Burke would say, too emotional uh, to act. But for the most part, Scarface did everything and Berwick loved him. Berwick actually got injured on set. He was bit by one of the many cats at, in, during a feeding one day. So that's kind of funny. Scarface would go on to be nominated for a Patsy, which is the Pet Actor Star of the Year Award, which is an award they gave to cats from 1951 to 1976. Unfortunately, Scarface would lose to Rascal the Raccoon, which is bullshit. If you ask me, loyal viewers may uh, pick up that this is the second animal actor that we've covered that has been nominated for a Patsy. Orangey from uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's uh, was nominated and won. Does the cat in the movie know what's going on? Absolutely. Scarface is the titular. He has the eye of the cat in the title. He is always watching. He knows what's going on. I didn't mention it a lot, but there's a lot of cat action in here. There's actually a scene where Scarface is going at it with the murderer. It's pretty great. So obviously he knows exactly what's going on at all times. Would this movie be better with less cats? The answer is no, as always. Would this movie be better with more cats? Even with 50 plus cats possibly in this movie, the answer is yes, as always, my cat.
Okay, so you've seen us talk about a lot of movies on this show. Gosh, that's all we do. That's pretty much that's all we do. That's literally all we do. That's all we do, and we love movies. But a lot of other people love movies, and there's a lot of movies out there that like we haven't seen that uh, we like or that we might like. These movies are, are things you got to check out, and we don't want you to just rely on us for that. Yeah, or in other words, you don't have to take our <laughs> word for it. Hi, my name's Matt, uh, and I'm going to tell you about this movie. Wait, no, not the game. Twister's Revenge, which is also on this disc. It's by a Wisconsin filmmaker named Bill Rubane, and it is about a woman who gets kidnapped by these three rednecks because they want to use the AI-powered monster truck she invented to help them do crimes. Um, unfortunately for them, the truck has other plans. This movie is awesome. It's from 1987. It's basically like a live-action Hanna-Barbera cartoon, especially good if you like to see Anything and everything get pancaked by a monster truck. You should definitely check it out. What's up? Viva Physical Media. My name is Carlo. I am from Belgium. I have a podcast with my buddy Dan Gorman, who's uh, mailed some stuff in to the show before. Uh, really enjoying it. I've been watching episodes all day. So yeah, I have a suggestion for a movie. Bloody Muscle Bodybuilder in Hell. It says AKA Japanese Evil Dead on the bottom. That's not an official title. But it's very much in the spirit of what that movie is about. It is just like 60 minutes of uh, homemade DIY splatter directed by Shinichi Fukazawa. Uh, I believe he started making this in the 90s, but he couldn't get it finished until the 2000s, which is when it officially came out. But it feels like it was made in the 80s, uh, like directly after and influenced by Evil Dead. So yeah, I have no idea if this has the release in the US, but I'm sure you can get your hands on it if you don't already have it, which I'm sure you do. Highest recommendation, this one. A lot of fun, really short, really cool effects. Keep doing what you're doing and thanks for listening. All right, so it is our 20th episode and we, as you may remember, we do not have one dog movie nope. to talk about today, but we decided to highlight a few of our favorite dog performances in Nog nog dog <laughs> in non dog movies in non dog, in non -dog movies <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> we decided to highlight some of our favorite performances in non dog movies yes i just thought this would be fun cuz uh, i like a lot of dog performances and uh, you, you might know, have seen his you might you have even seen, seen my, his recommendation list which all three of my picks are on my recommendations list so if you've seen that then you won't be surprised and none if of my you, none of mine are very surprising those uh, recommendation but, lists if you go to blog.scarecrow.com slash scarecrow recommend. I thought it'd be fun to pick out some performances of doggies that we like that aren't, where the whole movie isn't about the dog or, you know, it's not. Sometimes it doesn't need to be. You know, it's not a, a whole story of the dog, but the dog gives a good, gives a good performance or, or plays, or plays an important part. Whether it's for a few seconds or a lot of the movie. And uh, my first one is, is, is one of the most obvious dog performances of all time, although I will say I picked it because I do think it's one of the best performances in a movie of all time, and it is the thing, the main dog who they, you know, find, they bring into their kennel. Just one of the most controlled performances you'll ever see in a movie, this dog. This dog is just staring so yeah. intensely. I can see it's it insane. in my brain right now. The dog is my favorite performance in the entire movie. And this is a movie full of a lot of great performances. This movie has Kurt Russell in it, for God's Drinking sake. Drinking whiskey. Yeah, dumping whiskey into a computer. But the dog, <laughs> man, the dog kills me. It feels like the dog in this movie knows <laughs> that it's in the thing. It's like, I, I got this. I, I, read, dog, I read the script. The I know how to act in this movie. Read the assignment, yeah. read the script, knew what he was doing. <laughs> I know what I'm supposed to do. It's like a really like kind of a bleak, intense kind of, yeah, yeah, I know, I got it. I I know, <laughs> you just call just say action and I'll do it. Also, this is another great movie if you want to combat the heat. My movie for dog performance is Road Games. Another Australian movie. You know how I like those. Um, Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, Stacey Heach is a truck driver and he is trucking through uh, Australia and he can't pick up hitchhikers, he's not supposed to. Right. But he ends up seeing this, this guy who he thinks is a killer abducting women basically and and then there becomes a whole cat and mouse type thing with jamie lee curtis he eventually picks her up anyways before he picks her up he does have a companion with him most of the time 
And it's his dog who's actually supposed to be a dingo. And if we're lucky, we might even get a disco dolly for dessert, right, me? Oh, and I won't forget the doggy bag. And his name is uh, Boswell, I think. And uh, he's supposed to be a dingo in the movie. He's not. He's not a dingo because you can't. I guess you can't train dingoes, from what I read. Oh, they're like impossible to domesticate or something like that. That makes like sense. That. It's like training, trying to train like a coyote a or something. Dude, yeah. I guess. So the dog's actually a dog, an Australian Red, I think, is what it's called, which is like an actual partial dingo. So it's kind of like a, if you get like a wolf, like okay. a partial wolf, to play a wolf in a movie. Right. And uh, the dog's name in real life, I think, is I think it's Killer or something, Aww. like in real life. Aww. And I guess uh, according to <laughs> Stacy Heach, he was a joy to work with. He was a fabulous animal. Very smart. Very smart. In this movie is great though because he just sits in the passenger seat and uh, Stacy Keats just talks a lot while he's driving, yeah. as you would if you were a truck driver alone for a really long time. And he kind of talks to his dog as though he were his like human companion. And the dog, you can see the dog just kind of like, yeah, you're my buddy. We're on the road. <laughs> It's a great dog performance, I definitely, uh, and it's a great movie too, I re recommend you check it out. You gonna go straight for a scratch, buddy? My next one is uh, Shifting Gears, is uh, Vittorio De Sica's masterpiece, Umberto D. Well, you were saying that we th I, we think this was recommended by somebody as may I think maybe- on, our, on the letterbox list of movies that I, that I tracked that yeah. we gave someone wrote that we should watch it. I, I watched it again. I actually watched it just today again because I hadn't seen it in a long time. And it's not quite like enough of the, it's not enough about the dog to be a dog, a dog yeah, movie. Yeah, we kind of have to make that decision. But, uh, but uh, the dog, Flyke, is great in this. So Umberto D is, Ooh. It's Vittorio De Sica's favorite movie of his, uh, and I, it's also my favorite Vittorio De Sica movie. Post-war, you know, neorealist Italian cinema. Essentially, it's like this watching this old man sort of have been left behind by society. It's, you know, just one thing after another, he's gonna get evicted, nobody wants to help him, you know, everybody's kind of like, like, society's moving on. The one constant through his struggles is his dog, his little uh, Jack Russell Terrier, at one point, he goes to the hospital, he goes back to his house. His house has been, you know, his apartment's been all torn apart by the landlady. He's like, where's my dog? And the maid, who's his, like, kind of his only other friend, is like, I don't know, he must have run away. And he goes to the dog pound to find, try and find his dog. And it's this, very, it's this whole tragic scene, yeah. love, we find your dog and you're not here, you know, we're gonna kill, we'll left, you know, we kill the dog, okay. kill the strays or whatever. And he finds his dog again, and he's just sort of, like, going through this world that doesn't, want him around anymore and if you haven't seen uh umberto d i'm sorry if you have but i'm gonna have to spoil it it's okay spoil I'm, it i'm gonna have to spoil <laughs> it but if you haven't seen it and you're watching uh skip this part or well, stop it do what watch I him stop do what it. i can't do stop it watch umberto d come back he decides umberto at some point decides i'm gonna kill myself I'm just gonna, he looks at the train tracks and he's like i'm gonna kill myself the world doesn't want me i'm gonna yeah. kill myself he there's this whole scene where he tries to give uh, flake away to this boarding house of, for dogs, but they're like these other dogs are barking. They don't they don't seem to be happy there. Like scared. Like decides I can't give him away. So then he's like walking on the train tracks and he's holding the dog and he's like I'm, you know we're just gonna both go together. And the dog's like Dude, the dog so, like this is making me so the sad. dog freaks out and the dog's like the dog's like no no. Well first he tries to give it away to a little girl and her her nanny's like no, uh, and then he tries to run away from the dog. The dog like finds him. And he comes and he goes to the train tracks. He's like, we're gonna jump in this train. And the dog's like, ah, and freaks out and runs away. And then Umberto's like, oh no. And so he doesn't jump in front of the train. And But then he's like going to Flake, Flake, come here. And he's like, the dog's like, no. And the dog like runs away from him. And he's like, the dog runs a little ways away from him, but keeps like, you know, stopping and looking back. And he's like, come here. And the dog's like, I'm afraid of you right now. The dog eventually, he's like, come play with this pine cone. And it ends with him running down this lane, kind of like playing with the dog. And it's, again, <laughs> We don't know what the next day is going to be like for this guy, but at the end of the movie, it's uh, very. Uh, but anyway, it's very, it's very moving. It's very moving, and especially yeah, like the last rough. 15 minutes there that I just uh, described are like, are like pretty, pretty heartbreaking. Um, and it's it essentially comes down to it's just one of my favorite dog performances because it comes down to this dog, who who has been in the background a lot and kind of has been his dog, and then kind of comes to the foreground and is like the thing that saves him from 
from himself. killing himself, kind of, you know? Yeah. Uh, anyway, Umberto D. Uh, yeah, so... And so, I feel you know. like dogs, <laughs> dogs and animals in general are great for doing that, you know? Yeah. Like, they're there for you with emotional hardships, and they can sense your vibes, and... Yeah. You know, maybe if you're feeling down, you should adopt an animal. <laughs> there you know. go. If, if you if you're prepared to take care of one. There you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, not not that uh, <laughs> melodramatic, but we got the Boogans. That's my next pick. The dog performance <laughs> in this movie is creme de la creme. Gosh, I forgot what kind of dog it was. Not a poodle. It's like a Bichon something named Tiger. And basically this movie is about, uh, I haven't seen it in a really long time, but this is what I recall. This movie is about a monster that <laughs> comes loose from like an underground mine and then travels to this uh, secluded cabin where these people are having a vacation <laughs> with their dog, Tiger. <laughs> what I do remember about this movie is this dog is constantly also being confronted with this monster. Um, it's not just like, Oh, it's someone's dog, and then these humans are dealing with this monster. But it also like has shots of like the dog like seeing the monster around the <laughs> corner and being like, "What the fuck is that?" And like <laughs> dealing with uh, facing this creature as well. My my review on Letterbox was one of the best dog performances I've ever seen, and I recall that to be true. My next one is what I consider the greatest. But my favorite, my favorite movie uh, dog of all time, which is the from the Road Warrior. Another Australian movie that starts yeah. with the word road. I love the dog in this, whose name is in the movie is only dog, and I don't know the the dog actor's name. If you listen to the commentary track by George Miller and the uh, director of photography, they have nothing but great things to say about the dog. Oh, though they're good. like, she was so good. It's like her and Max have this, uh, you know, simpatico unspoken thing there's just you know he captures the uh, gyro captain i'm not going to describe the plot of the road warrior to you guys sorry but he just he uh he <laughs> captures the you know the gyro captain <laughs> If you haven't seen The Road Warrior, I guess, uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> but also, like, come uh, on, you guys. Watch the, but watch The Road yeah. Warrior. Dog dog doesn't make it, but he, uh, she goes down fighting. A lot of roads with people driving around with their dogs in Australia. And we love them. Okay, so this is one where the dog performance is brief, but just... Uh, Bride of Reanimator. Lady wakes up, goes down the stairs to the basement. Uh -huh. She sees something behind the dude's like laboratory door. And then he opens it and he's like, what are you doing down here? You're not supposed to be down here. And she's like, oh wait, that's my dog. Like she's, she's like, that's my dog or like Angel or whatever the dog's name is. And she goes to pet her, her little dog. Angel, sweetie. And then all of a sudden this human hand comes out and shakes her hand. <laughs> he, he fucked with the dog and, and attached the human hand <laughs> to the dog and she she screams and freaks out and then it's all, that's basically it. I've seen this movie a couple times and ever, <laughs> ever since I always, whenever anyone brings up Bride of Reanimator, I'm like, oh yeah, the dog with the human hand? That's so funny, right? And so I had to include it. Hey Pooch, where did you come from? <laughs> from Peru. Cool. I actually have that checked out right now because I was like, I was like, I guess I should watch the sequel. I've heard, I've heard have okay things. I've heard okay things about it. I've only seen Reanimator. So this movie, actually, uh, in general, it's not as good as Reanimator. It takes a, a quite a while to ramp up. Yeah. But it's one of those movies that, like, the last thirty minutes is completely like, oh my god. Just stick with it, and you know you'll get that dog human handshake eventually. Yeah, that's really what I'm watching for. <laughs> oh, you know, runner up for like now since we since we're talking about it for that since it came up would be a. A good I don't know if it's a good dog performance but a very brief uh, dog uh, creep creepo creepo dog scene in uh, the 70s invasion of the body snatchers the Kaufman invasion of body snatchers where like the the you know homeless guy and his dog are sleeping there and the pods are there and then when you see later 
the dog but with the guy's head, oh, no. it's, so, it's so fucked up. Similar to that, a Mars attack, where Sarah <laughs> Jessica Parker's head is on the Chihuahua. Another little run, runner up that we talked about earlier is Intoxic Avenger. In my brain, it, they had so much more screen time, but I, I looked up the clip before I got here. It's and very it's, short. It's literally mm -hmm. um, the, the blind woman seeing eye dog. They're at the restaurant, and there's like uh, the hooligans that come in. And they like, like gun or shooting they, everybody. They like shoot everybody, and they're like, whoa is this your dog and then they they shoot the the golden <laughs> retriever who's just like smiling and it's just like such a fake like it shows like the bullet entry and then it just literally looks like someone took this dog and just like on a linoleum floor just like skin him across the linoleum floor and he's just like <laughs> but he's like is he like splayed yeah. out like this he's like but yeah. he looks so happy. He's, he looks just been, happy. he's just been blown away by these bad guys. It's great. So, you know, we focus ceiling. a lot about, a lot on, like, just movie, dog movies. But we don't want to ignore the fact that many movies also have good dogs these in them. These have dog, and these aren't the only ones. There's no. a lot out there. But these, we just didn't want to take up your whole night about all the dog Jeez. performances we love. Because I could. <laughs> Uh, if you have go any drinking favorite, with me sometime. If you have any do favorite it. dog performances in non-dog <laughs> movies, email us viva at scarecrow.com and let us know. We have something real fun for next time. We hope. I don't know. I haven't I seen it. I don't have know you either. seen it? No, but I'm just excited that it's not a dramatic one. I think that's my brain. Oh, I'm just excited it's not Air Bud 2 or whatever. Too, that's so, also you know, true. I, although I, I did like, like Air Bud. I still like shook up from White God and <laughs> I just like I'm still like, oh, we are uh, going to be watching. Play dead. The beast is loose, driven by its lust for blood. Play dead. It may be the last thing you do. So it's this, not the it, dog isn't trained. The dog is literally under a magical spell yeah, so to kill people. And you know that dogs are Rottweiler because those yeah. are bad dogs. Um, it would be funny if this was just like a golden retriever. <laughs> I always think it would be funnier if it was like so, the the really mean dog. Ninety five percent of the time, it would be funnier with a golden retriever. Doesn't matter what we're talking about. Because it's like a fucking if it was a pit bull or a Doberman or a Rottweiler or whatever. It's, like, it's yeah. like well, yeah, those are dogs were bred for that, and they're like or like a horny Chihuahua. Well, I don't know. That they're would be too. Old. That would be too funny. They're old. That would be too far. Old. That'd be too. It's a horny Chihuahua wearing little booties. Ugh. Play Dead is our next one. It yeah. looks it looks to be awesome. There's an image of this dog holding like a can of like lie on the back like he's gonna like poison some people i'm hoping that happens anyway we'll uh we'll, we'll let you know next next episode yeah, stay so tuned. so tune tune in to see how we feel yeah. about play dead it's a game of death played in blood open the door and you play dead Bucket's Anything empty. Nothing. Oh, there's nothing. Stickers. There's some stickers. There's some we stickers we ain't over. stuck. We ain't stuck yet. But otherwise, the movies are all gone. Oh, but what's down here? So you saw this earlier, and this was uh, another another painting by our fan Jordan, who did this time did the Allure Cinephiles. Thank you, Jordan, for your artwork of all three of us. Now I don't know what else. There yeah, is what are you gonna do it. next? I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. This is uh, <laughs> I'm ex I'm excited to see. We always love but, uh, getting fan art I like that's really art, awesome yeah. so if you're out there want to try your hand at drawing us go for it viva, do it viva at scarecrow.com yeah or 5030 roosevelt way northeast seattle washington 98105 scarecrow video mm -hmm. or if you're in town or just, just like, or bring it just bring it by just come on in. bring it by you know bring come by. on in because we are open yeah. to the public we have ac you can come in and browse around wear your mask of course but come say hi and and enjoy the actual, the event of going to the video store. Yeah, but don't forget to also check out all our stuff that's online. We got us, you got Scarecrow Radio with Ben and Darcy, Soundtrack Cinema with Mark Steiner, you got the Art House to the Fart House, Kate and Jamie, that's yep. also on our YouTube page right here. That's pretty much it, so. Oh, if you come into Scarecrow, we have a new section up and it's staff picks of movies that have come out on physical media over the past year or so that we don't want you to miss out on. It's called Welcome Back. We're looking at it right now, you can't really see it, but it's at the back of our store on the right hand side in our special section. I'll put a shot of it in yeah. while we do this. While so let's see what's so. there. There's some good stuff. We will uh, see you next time for our big 21st episode where we're Whoa. finally legal. We're we legal. Drink. We're legal to drink. So we'll be having <laughs> a drink or two. Uh, maybe we'll, I don't know. I love, like, we'll do a shot or something. I don't know. So uh, <laughs> keep watching. Keep watching movies. And uh, uh, Viva Physical Media. Viva Physical Media. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye.